Als medarbetare. Jag är er väldigt stolt on you. Isn't it sad? Isn't it sad? Nobody posed that question, right? That a Dutchman has to buy Saab? That's pretty awkward, right? In a country which is so renowned for its wonderful industries, for its engineering capabilities, that it required a Dutchman to save Saab from the brink of extinction. I have always wondered about that. It must have been awful, awful for the Swedish media to find out that I had a luxury life because I've been working very hard all of my life. And, uh, and actually made some money. Mm. But when Saab was in a, a crisis, you were living a rich life. <laughs> Do you understand? That is, that is, that is, that is I think, only in Sweden. Order. Only in Sweden would you see... Uh, uh, because what would they expect me to do? To burn my boat because the company is in trouble? I didn't see the boat or my family or my wife or my children for a year, almost two years, because I decided that saving SAP was the right thing to do. Um, the Swedish criticism of a luxury life is, to me, is so hard to imagine. It's the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest disappointment in my career. But uh, the, the forces that were working against us were simply bigger than we were. The, the media also have some form of an incentive, right? When I got from one of our own people here a picture of the coverage of Dagens Nieter. Müller kann Ente Räder Saab. I thought, well, we'll see about that. The lesson that I have learned more than anyone else is you cannot have a company like Saab, which lives in a glass house for everyone to see. It doesn't happen with Volvo. You can, you can get away with murder at Volvo, but not at Saab. I don't know why. I'm just a foreigner. What do I know? You look like a rock star duo from the 60s. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. Rock stars from the 60s. Yeah. Our oh, 70s, 80s. <laughs> 80s. I was one in the I 60s. I born in the 60s, I mean. I was from 59. <laughs> That's good. Uh, okay, but Victor, you are in Trollhätta now. What are your feelings when you look back to the Saab years? Uh, I mean, look at this. This is just such a wonderful, wonderful event. All these enthusiasts bringing their cars, looking at uh, even the cars that John Arkan and myself made, the new generation 95, the 95 station wagon. Uh, it's great to see that the brand is alive and kicking. And in hindsight, the Saab spirit, a lot of people talked about the Saab spirit. Uh, could you describe that? The Saab spirit is one of never giving up. The Saab spirit is one of uh, um, quality. There was a tremendous uh, quality thinking in the organization and ingenuity. And, and I think that the cars that are represented here today uh, ooze that Saab mentality uh, throughout. And in hindsight, looking back, uh, it's 11 years since the, the, the company went bankrupt. But you, when you look back on these this, this days, what part did it play in your life? <laughs> that was a, quite an important period, as you can imagine. Um, it was uh, sensational and extremely sad at the same time. Um, it was a primarily, I have nothing but fond memories of it. Uh, the end was very sad, it was absolutely unnecessary. But you know, uh, it is what it is, you have to come to terms with that. Um, and after 11 years, it feels really good to be back here. It does. And obviously you still have a strong feelings for Saab because you are here. So uh, why did you decide to, to come here to the, celebrate the 75 years of Saab car? Because I have very strong feelings for the brand, as you said. <laughs> That's exactly the reason. And, and to see Jan-Ock. You are still friends, you, you have, a, have had contacts during the years. Absolutely, yeah. First we had a great time in court together. <laughs> and we beat the shit out of Olaf Solgren. Olaf, we remember you. And, uh, and then we still, were, of course, we're friends, yes. Yeah. yes. Maybe you could start a band. Anyway. <laughs> well, we're thinking about it, actually. We first have to learn to play an instrument. Yeah. And, but we're young, right? There's nothing we can't master in a matter of a decade or two. So, we're fine. But you will be on stage later on today. Uh, yes, but that's without the instruments. <laughs> Sweater.
Det blir bra. Ja. Ja, det är väl kul att få vara med i den, det sammanhanget då. Absolut, det är jättekul. Så att det blir spännande. What are your feelings about to participate in the celebration at the square today? I can't wait to see the Ursap on the road. That's really, really... In all the years, the years that I was here, I've never seen that. So that's new to me. Fantastic. Oh, thanks for taking time to talk with us. A pleasure. Thanks. No problem. Signing any autographs? Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Did you send him? The band yeah, yes. is starting yes, with. <laughs> but this is what this is what rock stars do. Yes. Yeah. Is he a rock star? Oh, of course he is, yeah. and he's he doing it too. Yeah. <laughs> you see, a little bit older rock stars, but. Well, it's uh, extremely impressive to see so many people sharing the passion for the brand. The Saab spirit is alive and kicking, uh, obviously. And uh, it's just, um, for me, and I'm sure for Yonaka and for many of you, it's sad that we celebrate the 75 years of Saab without Saab actually being there. It's the big elephant in the room, right? And, um, but the spirit of Saab is being carried on by so many people holding the torch of the brand. And uh, this, this brand is far from dead. And uh, I'm very proud of everybody that brought his cars here today and uh, showed them with such passion, such ingenuity, keeping them going. Uh, it was quite an impressive uh, day for us. But I, I read an article that you talked about the spirit at the Saab company among the employees. Uh, maybe you should tell us about that as well. Well, uh, that's almost hard to speak about because uh, it was the single single decision-making point for us to step into Saab in uh, 2010. Because um, I'll never forget that I came to the factory for the first time and Gunnar Brunius showed me around and he showed me how committed everybody was, how much they loved the business, how dedicated they were. And I made a promise to him at the time and I'm, I didn't break that one, okay, like good, the one that good. I just broke to him. That's good. Um, no, I didn't break that promise. No. Uh, I, I promised him that I would give everything I could to try to save the company. And, uh, and at the time, we did. General Motors put the company into voluntary reconstruction, but we got it out, we got it running. Yonaka managed to get the production back up, and, uh, and we had a fantastic chance of making it absolutely fantastic chance of making it. But it was the employees of Saab that made the company. Yeah. I mean, you made that company to what it was, and I'm still very proud of them, how they set, set it through, because it was a terrible period in the end. Terrible. It's like you buy a house, you agree the price, and whilst you're waiting for the house to be delivered to you, the owner, the previous owner, sets it on fire and then says, well, that's your problem now, you're buying the house. So you either buy a burning house or you don't buy it at all. And, um, and I decided to buy the burning house. Not about money, this has nothing to do with money. This was about saving an iconic brand with an amazing workforce and a beautiful product portfolio and a fabulous, fabulous future had it been allowed to live. And I think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing to uh, to memorize uh, the uh, uh, very unfortunate uh, events of uh, 19 December, a date which is carved in my memory with uh, blood. And I'll never forget that I was driving to the court on the morning of the 19th of December. I handed in the file where we applied for bankruptcy ourselves. And, uh, and I said to the guy behind the, the counter at the uh, courthouse, I surrender. And it felt, it felt so horrible. It's like a moment you'll never forget in your entire life, so horrible it was. It's like, uh, uh, where you know everybody knows exactly where he was on 911. This was my 911 moment. It's safe that I was in the building. I have hardly any negative to remember, uh, hardly anything negative. The people at SAP were, I mean, they were the best. They were fantastic, absolutely 
brilliant, enthusiastic, loyal, motivated, professional uh, workforce. The best workforce any owner could ever hope to have. Of course, uh, there is uh, a dark side to the, to the memories, and the dark side is, of course, that we didn't make it. I was responsible for three and a half thousand people, and they all relied on me. Uh, failing them was my worst nightmare. And uh, I thought this is going to be the toughest, toughest thing I've ever done in my life. And uh, they applauded for a few minutes. It was unbelievable. Tre månader efter konkursen träffar vi Victor Muller på Grand Hotel i Stockholm. When I wake up in the morning, I can look in the mirror and don't think of myself as what a god awful coward he ran, right? I didn't run. I would never run. Everybody else ran. I was there completely on my own. Now, three months later, um, looking back. I honestly wonder how on earth I managed to do that. Because it was so bad, it was so bad, that um, I just don't know how I did it. But with John O'Kajunson leaving the company, it really coincided with the suppliers' uh, uproar when they didn't get paid and they stopped the delivery. Uh, was that caused, do you think, by John Oakley leaving the company? I think it was uh, definitely not um, helpful that he left because they had a lot of confidence in him, in him personally. And uh, the fact that he announced that he left was, I'm sure, perceived as him leaving ship. Uh, and I'm pretty convinced that most suppliers thought if he's leaving, probably the whole thing is going down. Um, which in fact at the time wasn't the case, but it was, became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I couldn't stop Janaka from going, and I can only imagine how tired he was, but it was a serious blow for me. But by default, by f the fact that nobody else wanted to take the job when the ship was on fire, I had to become the captain and sail it into safe harbor. Well, I tried very hard, but it was a, it was a bit of an unfair battle. Why do you think the Swedish government didn't do more to assist Solv? Ask the Swedish government. But you must have a picture of that. The fact that the Swedish government didn't act was a very serious blow to us. Didn't act in just simply approving Antonov in April 2011 when everything was still very much manageable. That was a serious blow. From that moment on, basically we went into a downward spiral. I mean, I went to China, I made deals left, right and center. But um, there was zero support from anywhere. So I was really doing this battle more or less on my own. Surely when you went into this, uh, you must have had in your mind that uh, I am here to earn money. What was your calculation? Oh, it was not very difficult. The company was bought for $74 million. The company could have made easily, easily three, four hundred million euros by 2015, 2016. It should have been a business that would have been worth two billion euros without any problem. Um, so business, business wise, it wasn't uh, rocket science. You bought it for so little money. If you only got it just right, it would have already been a very valuable business. By 2015, we figured you could have bought the largest independent premium car maker in the world. There must have been an Indian or a Chinese or a Brazilian that would have thought that that would be the missing link in his product portfolio. How much have you lost personally? 13 million euros, a lot of money. But that's, I'm not complaining about that. I'm an entrepreneur. I'll make it up. I'll do something else. Oh. Thank you uh, very much for that. Um, in fact, 
you should be applauding yourselves. What this company's gone through is just, you can't make this up. When I uh, addressed you for the first time two years ago, 23 months ago, um, this was about the last thing I had in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I didn't get here to, uh, to get an applause. I got here to say sorry. Sorry I put you through this hell. I got us here, I'll get us out. You can rest assured. I'll give anything, if it's the last thing I'll do, I'll get us out of this mess. The lesson that I have learned more than anyone else is you cannot have a company like Saab which lives in a glass house for everyone to see. Doesn't happen with Volvo. You can, you can get away with murder at Volvo, but not at Saab. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm just a foreigner. What do I know? Media, you know, we just have to take them for what they are. This is clearly a case of being with Saab means that you're exposed to the point that it is on the verge of ridiculous. But we knew that, right? I knew that. And still I underestimated the viciousness of the media when we had two hours of production stoppage six weeks ago. And next thing you know, within a matter of, uh, with one supplier, Schenker, and the next morning you have 92 suppliers because of the media blowing this thing out of proportion and basically saying Saab is going bankrupt. Well, guess what? Saab is not bankrupt and Saab will not go bankrupt. Are you crazy? Of course not. I've never seen a more depressed man than Mr. Chan, the chairman of Gao Tai, when on Friday he had to tell me, I can't do it. I want to do it, but I cannot. If I do, I will go to jail, right, basically. Maybe not directly to jail, but he would be tremendously exposed if he would do a transaction without the proper authorization. A Gao Tai deal com completely collapsing seemed like the end of the world to most people. But actually, to me, it was a tremendous opportunity to do a better deal. Having learned in the pressure cooker in the past few weeks what the problems would be to get the Chinese government alongside a transaction, um, we found ourselves the number one distributor in China. You cannot imagine the sheer size of Panda. I think it is conservatively assumable that we will be in production by two weeks from now. Just Never, ever give up. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard to say how proud I am today, one year into our deal, one year into an independent Saab. Jason has set out on developing the new Saab design language, taking in 47 years of Saab and translating that into what he feels is a SAP all about. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very proud to present to you our new concept car. It is like a bomb exploded here. It was just crazy. I think our objective with launching the Phoenix concept car was to create a buzz around the brand, demonstrating we're alive and kicking and we're going places. I think that worked very well. The interesting thing is that the focus of journalists and media in general has completely shifted away from the question, how are you going to make this work? Why do you think you can do something that GM never achieved in 20 years, right? That question kept on popping back up every time again. Uh, why do you think you can survive? That question has now been overtaken by questions on how successful are you going to be in China and when? What a great concept car, how much is going to be in the 9.3? A complete shift towards the future. And am I happy about that? Whoa, yeah. That's what we want to achieve. It's, it's worked. We are starting to see the, the, the results of our efforts to consistently tell the audience this is a fully funded business plan business, we're getting there, we're launching the products as we have uh, promised, so it's time to start discussions to 
commercially finance the company on normal terms and conditions as any other company would. Are you already into these discussions? We've just started. It's going to take time. How much time? I don't know. Ask the banks. I don't know. Uh, we have a, a very strong partnership. He's my financier and uh, I have been pretty relentless in telling the, everybody who wanted to hear it that A, he is absolutely 100% okay and has been accused of all sorts of things completely unjustifiedly. B, that he has been the best friend Saab ever had because without him Saab would have never survived and he's not being credited for that in any way, shape or form. Now, Trollhättan is up and running. It's one thing to build them, it's another to sell them. So our next job is to go out into markets and have our dealer body energized, our customers energized, and have them buy our cars. And in large quantities, because they're great cars. Victor, do you have a long stop here in Stockholm now? No, we're off uh, in uh, four hours to London. Oh. Just in and out. Yeah, yeah. now we're gonna sell. Sell, sell, sell like sell. hell. I have a message from your new shareholder. Long live Saab! I'm overwhelmed. Uh, nothing prepared me for this type of reception. I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to uh, regain the market share that uh, Saab has lost over the past two years. The transaction was extremely complicated. Um, you have to bear in mind that we were dealing with General Motors, European Investment Bank, NDO, Rick's Gelden. So it was, it was very complicated, but we managed to do it. Stolt on you.